I bid you all good morning, good evening, and good night, wherever you be watching this transmission. It is I, Mike Martins, coming to you, coming to you on the Uneducated Economist, Simon. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing awesome. Good evening, everybody. Uneducated Economist here. I got my man, Mike Martins, on today. He's going to hit us with all the good stuff. Mike, tell us, man, we've been together hanging out for probably what good four years now or so actually i i found a video that's older than like five years now is it five years oh my gosh yeah. man you know um i have to tell you for those who don't know mike was the very first person on youtube to get in contact with me and ask me for an interview and i was so taken back by that i was i have to tell you mike I was nervous. I was so nervous coming onto your show. I didn't, I didn't want to tell anybody that I didn't want to tell you that or anything, but I was like, I thought, Oh my gosh, here it is. I got this really popular YouTuber out there and he's asking me to be on his show. And man, after that day, my channel really took off and I really contribute a lot of the uh, success of this channel for that, that breaking through into into the interviews and stuff that you that you did for me, man. I cannot thank you enough for that. Oh, don't worry about it. So, uh, when I first saw you, uh, I said, I'm watching your channel. I'm like, okay, what's this guy going on about? What's he about? So I'm watching it. I'm like, wait a minute. This guy doesn't have an agenda. Wait a minute. This guy has, wait, this guy is not being political here. Wait a minute. This guy is just trying to find out the facts. Wait a minute. This guy's a real American. This guy is trying to, that's what, when I first saw you, I'm like, okay, this guy is, this, this guy, this is the guy right here. This is the guy, this is the guy. And then uh, that's what I saw in you the first, when I first saw you. And I said, I'm just going to email him, see what he says. He got back to me almost right away. I'm like, oh, cool. So we do, we did trends in the housing market. Uh, that was the first time we came on the show and we were talking about the housing and you were talking about lumber and the cost. And you were absolutely floored when I told you a junker, like that's completely like completely destroyed with, with fire. And I mean, you, there's no remnants of a house sells for $3.7 million. You were like, what? Because of the situation we've been having here and the disenfranchising of the Canadian middle class and the destruction of middle class and the mass exodus of Canadians leaving Canada because they just, they just can't afford to live the lives they lived in 1987, 1989, where wages and incomes were tied. Uh, tied to real estate prices. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the blue states of America got into this really bad habit of exporting homes, building homes and exporting them to foreign investing, lots of money laundering, and lots of money laundering. When I'm saying money laundering, we're in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year. And they've broken it down in Canada. You can look it up. There's an article that I referenced quite a bit. It's from Better Dwelling. Canada would be in a recession without money laundering. Our major GDP growth, our major contributor to growing our country is exporting home to foreign entities or numbered companies. And it's destroyed. We don't have many cities in Canada. So you look at it like this, Simon. Let, let's look at Florida, okay? You got Tampa Bay would be Vancouver. Then you got Edmonton would be Orlando. Then you got, you got Winnipeg will be... Um, uh, let's say uh, Tampa, Tampa Bay. Did I say Tampa Bay or Miami? And then the other one. So basically Florida is like all of Canada spread out with population, infrastructure and cities. Basically you have it all in Florida, but we are so disenfranchised. We're with nowhere left to go in our cities. Everything is completely unaffordable. And when, when the last I had you on my show on trends in the housing market, I was watching that video the average income earner needed to save 26 years to put a down payment on a one bedroom condo or something. Now it's 34 years. 34 years. Somebody has to save the average person has to save before they can put a down payment on a dwelling. Exactly, sir. Oh my gosh. Like that's like, you know, most of your life is gone by that time. Yes. Like, how do you raise kids in a house? How do you, you don't, you know, do family formation? You none of this stuff takes place, does it? Well, Simon, it goes back to my countless reiteration of the destruction of the of the middle class. And it's I believe in my heart of hearts, it's been done purposely. And I don't know why we're getting punished so badly, but it's so bad that people already weren't having families back in the early 2000s because 
because the affordability levels were just not there anymore. And 2010 Olympics, when the 2010 Olympics hit Vancouver, what happened was it, we were supposed to see a correction in 2010 in Canada. We were supposed to see a big housing correction because you guys saw your semi-correction in 2008, right? Mm-hmm. 2007 and eight, you saw a semi-correction and all the bail-ins and all that stuff. But in Canada, we just looked by and watched that happen and nothing happened to us. So in that time in 2010, the average house house was already 11 times the, uh, the upper average wage earner, 11 times. We were looking for a correction in 2010. Instead, Vancouver opened up and created the Vancouver model. You can look that up. You can see what it's about. No questions asked. Park your money in Canada with no nothing, no questions, no, no liability, no problems. Park your money in Canada. Park it in our real estate. And that's called the Vancouver model. Anyone can look that up and see what the guidelines are. And it's just basically opening up to foreign investing. And that basically crippled, destroyed our middle class. Yeah. So now this is something that's pretty interesting. Like how bad, like, I mean, you know, I know the foreign investment going into Canada was quite extreme, but, you know, I'm here in the United States and I kind of focus in on what's going on here. How bad was that foreign investment? I mean, was it so noticeable that like yes. everybody was like complaining about the foreign investment going in? I mean, was it really that bad? It was so bad that the radio and the mainstream media were telling people that it makes up 0.01% of the economy. Like, don't worry about it. It's not the problem. When the media is telling you that, it is a problem. I was so, walking the street. Yeah, I was. Yeah, they had like anti, like anti-propaganda propaganda. Right. That's, a, that's a brilliant way to put that, Simon. So what happened was I was walking the streets of Vancouver and showing all the empty buildings and the empty homes and all that. And um, a lot of the videos were taken down. I don't know why, but uh, a lot of the videos were taken down. And um, I was showing people firsthand what was happening, what was happening and how more and more people had to leave the cities. And, and I, I interviewed a few people that or doctors, uh, professionals, people of importance that actually contribute to the infrastructure were basically having to leave Vancouver and had to move to a small town in the interior because they just couldn't afford to eat anymore. Really? So like this was like literally creating a gentrification. Exactly. But the problem is it wasn't being replaced with more families or more, you know, it was just emptiness. And the, the city turned into an empty shell. Right. And this is what happened in Paris, uh, put in a vacant home tax back in 2017 because the city was turning into an empty shell. And uh, once they put the foreign buyers tax on, I think it was 68 percent. It was crazy, Simon. You have no idea. You could look up the Paris foreign buyers tax with vacant homes. You'll be floored when they had to raise taxes to a level where foreigners had to sell their properties or rent them out. Uh, to people because the city of Paris was turning into an empty shell completely. Vancouver's already turned like that. Toronto's become like that. Uh, Parts of of, of Manitoba's become like that. Other parts of Canada are starting to see this emptiness where the youth that lives there that was born, raised, educated, speak the language, part of the groups, the cliques or whatever they're part of, can't afford to be part of it no more. Wow. So these foreign, okay, just to make it clear for those who may may be missing this, you're saying that there was so much foreign investment, and then they never came to occupy the, the residence. They were just all empty. Like invest- so there was nobody ever there. They just bought There's, the property for investment purpose. I don't then- want to argue. I mean, I don't want. It's not that I want. I don't want to say that I know that they were all empty. There's a majority. We have a big empty home problem. Right. Now it's not just Canada. It's Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. They're fo- and the blue states of America. A lot of the blue states, you see a lot of vacant homes or complete office towers. Someone sent me a photo a few weeks ago that it's foreign invested owned by a a numbered company and there's nobody living in the tower. It's empty, right? The tower I lived in in Vancouver, I would walk into my, 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 I would would go into my apartment, my apartment lobby. I knew the concierge because there wasn't a lot of people living in my building. And he says, hey, Mikey, you wanna see something cool? I'm like, what is it? So he has keys. So he takes me to apartments, completely empty, since the apartment was built in 2003 with the plastic on the on the on the on the on the on the microwave plastic on the counters plastic from the builder that it's still there and like he showed me like 50 units that are completely empty and they're owned yeah no kidding so that like 
I mean, that is just an incredible thing to think about, you know, that all this foreign investment coming in is just literally just drove out the availability of anybody to be able to buy a home. It's no wonder why they're creating these taxes. Now, they just recently done, they're trying to do something about that, right? And they just changed some laws. Too little, too late. I wrote, I made a video a a week, a week and a half ago. I took my time to make this video. It's too little, too late. They should have implemented the foreign buyers ban when New Zealand implemented it in 2017. In New Zealand, Jacinta Ardern implemented uh, no foreign buyers allowed, and you started to see an uptick and a correction in the housing market almost overnight uh, in New Zealand. Canada should have implemented it back in 2017 if they wanted to really get. There's only two years left in this current Trudeau administration that we're like basically in hell that under this administration that we need to. He's got two years left, so he needs to kind of do something to say, well, I tried to help. I tried to save housing middle class and getting families into homes, right? So they got to show that they're trying or they care, but it's just too little too late. It's, it's gone too far, right? Yeah. Now, I want to throw something out there, and it's kind of important. So, Simon, you could see how deep this has gotten and how it's disenfranchised so much of us, okay? There's an article, and I advise you guys to look this up because this is so far out left field. That you're going to have to look this up because it sounds and, 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 and it's being reported by Canadian mainstream media too. the CBC, the CTV, all the Canadian major outlets were reporting this in 2017 and in 2018. Are you ready for this, Simon? I am. Foreign investors bringing in money, but using fentanyl that they're making in China and they point out the factories in what city and province in China, they point out a complete diagram of where the money's coming from, how the money is being washed through Canadian real estate after the proceeds of the fentanyl sales. So we've been having a fentanyl problem here in Canada since 2010, and it's been wiping out our youth here in Canada. It's been disenfranchising and destroying young families and using and losing young loved ones to this and and the money's been re and you could go on the CTV the CBC whatever you want type in 2017 gangs fentanyl money laundering Vancouver real estate you'll see what i'm talking about and you'll be like they were openly reporting this but nothing happened wow so they came to your country sold a bunch of drugs took the profit from the drugs and bought up your real estate and yes now if you I go mean, that's the <laughs> You could go, uh, Simon, you could go into the, just type in what I said. You'll find it. You'll find quite a few of them, actually, different uh, outlets reporting this around that date that I said. You are going to be like, wow. Now, I know, I don't know this for a fact, but I know this from experience and talking to people. This has been happening in California. Uh, It started happening in California, believe it or not, but it wasn't fentanyl opioids, other stuff back then. 1993, it started in San Francisco. It made its way down to LA County. Then from LA County uh, in the early 2000s, you start to see more and more empty homes, vacant homes and, and, and stuff. And then this created this effect that I call for you guys in America, Amerifornia. Now, Amerifornia is basically from Vancouver, Canada border, like the border where Washington state all the way to Tijuana border. That whole left part of America where you are in Oregon and Washington state, I believe that's been infiltrated through money laundering, all kinds of bizarre stuff and all the synthetic weeds and all that stuff. And I believe wholeheartedly that what happened was it started to like, there's a, a, an article again, I'm going to ask everyone to look this up. Um, Vancouver puts a foreign buyer's tax in 2016, 2017, and it prompted foreign investors to go to Seattle and Toronto. And if you look from that timeline forward, the housing markets went like this plateau in Seattle to crazy. And then what, what Seattle's answer to it, it wasn't the foreign investors that were doing it and leaving all the apartments empty. It was the tech workers. And I spoke to a tech worker in Seattle and you know what he told me? He's like, that's BS Mike. And I'm going to tell you why there's 11 of us living in a two bedroom apartment. So it's not that it's not, we can't afford to live in Seattle and they're blaming the tech workers and the millennials. No, it's foreign investing that's been coming in. So ever since Vancouver put that foreign buyers tax on, it destroyed King County in Washington and destroyed Toronto. And if you look at the timeline of housing and pricing, you would see, oh my God. And the article read, it's mainstream media reporting it. Vancouver foreign buyers tax has prompted foreign investors, Chinese foreign investors, this Chinese, 
to Seattle and Toronto in a frantic pace. That's how the article spread out. You could read it, you could see it, and you could confirm it. And it's basically destroyed both housing markets literally overnight. Wow, that's incredible. And so you can actually track this by the time that they put those laws into place in Vancouver to yes. stop it from happening. You could almost see it almost immediately. Right. right? I mean, you can see the effects of it starting to take place throughout the rest of the other, the other regions that you were talking about. I overnight. mean, it's just like, it's obvious, right? Yeah, if you, if you go to my YouTube channel, click on this a little magnifying glass, just type mm -hmm. in fr frantic pace. You'll see the, the video I'm talking about. Oh, that's from 2017. What's Mike talking about here? Click. Oh, okay. Then you look at the, 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 the graphs and you'll see, wow, it's actually played such a big part. And that's why Mr. Uh, Governor uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida is, is basically saying, we don't want Chinese investing. We don't want this. We don't want you investing in Florida. We don't want, it's been very front in the front there. I don't know if you've noticed that those headlines. But I, I know you don't go. Yes, I, I haven't. I, I mean, to be honest with you, when it comes to Canadian like real estate and stuff like that, I really missed the boat on 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 watching the information coming out of that one. That's why I'm kind of relying on you right now oh, for your information. I, I'll talk about Ron DeSantis down in Florida. OK, Governor DeSantis. If you look okay. at what he's been saying lately about the rhetoric about foreign investing in Florida and so we don't want you here, you can look it up. He's been very vocal about foreign investing in the state of Florida Oh, really? because he doesn't want the Amerifornia effect, because this is the, what I believe. Amerifornia is basically America become California all over, where basically um, multiple levels of government, um, high taxes, dirty, uh, tons of homelessness, drug infest. And that's what I call Amerifornia. And I've been calling Amerifornia's coming, wake up. So now, Simon, now we got Texifornia where Texas is starting to turn into California, where it's becoming and it's, it's molding or, or transforming into the places they left and create the same problem that they left behind in where they're moving to. Mm -hmm. And that's become, and that's my biggest fear for America because for me as a Canadian living in Canada, America is the most important country to me. It's the most important country. It's the last beacon of light for us in Canada, because if the flame goes out in America, we are in a lot of trouble here in Canada because America has a constitution. It has the right to bear arms. America has, the, I mean, they have the Bill of Rights. They have everything working for them, for the people, by the people, right? Yep. The problem that I'm, we're facing here in Canada that we're afraid that America is going to go the way of Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, uh, that's what I'm severely afraid for, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, just, well, you know, and he really should be because, you know, as somebody who like, I mean, I personally am not political, you know, that I don't get into politics. I don't really discuss them, but I follow the constitution. I'm a constitutionalist. I carry a copy of the constitution on my desk. You know, I've memorized the bill of rights. I can dictate the fourth amendment. You know, if somebody was to ever ask me about, you know, searching my vehicle, I can straight up tell them, you know, it was just like the rights of the accused to be free from, you know, being invaded. Is, is something that we have. And a lot of people don't know how to protect their rights. You know, I mean, you know, when, when you can be able to say it, like, you know, the rights of the accused to be free from, in, you know, to be, how do, how do you go about this? Like when, when a cop, like a cop or somebody of authority begins to invade your private privacy, right? Your property. And, you have like this this moment of freedom that you are retaining that you let go right the moment that a cop says or somebody of authority says hey i want to in, in you know look in your car i want to look in your apartment or something like that and the moment that you let that go like you're like um well i i don't want to make them mad or i don't know what my rights are or whatever and you let that go it's gone i mean it is gone mm. so in order for like the constitution to be valid, the people themselves have to enforce that to that to take place. Uphold. And I just and I just don't see how it is that the people can do that. They they're not aware of their rights. They don't know when it is that they need to protect them. They don't understand most constitutional laws. And so when it comes down to voting for somebody who is going to protect those rights, I just don't think we know how to do it. The majority. Right. You know. And so that's it's 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 scary to think about. Um, it's scary on my end. 
to think mm. that America, that bright, that light of freedom of, or that light of, you know, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of, 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 of the press is, is diminishing uh, on a daily basis. It scares me up here because I'm in a very socialist run country. Our media is bought and paid for by taxpayers, right? And I wrote a letter to the YouTube, to uh, an email, sorry, to YouTube asking them, you should put at the bottom of the CTV, the CBC, all the Canadian outlets saying, this is funded all in part of Canadian taxpayers, right? Because people need to know that they're watching government funded, um, government funded media here in Canada. None of it. They're not generating any profits. Nobody watch our mainstream media. There's cooking shows that do better than um, our mainstream media here. So that's what people need to understand when they're watching anything from Canada. Be very careful what you're watching because we are very heavily censored here. We are very heavily censored. And I'm just afraid, again, if America burns out, if that light burns out, you know, I've tried to, to immigrate to America. I've did everything by the book and they just declined me. So I did my, I did everything. Like I got a, a corporation to sponsor me, a big one. And I made sure I was qualified. I had to run ads to make sure I wasn't stealing an American's job. I did everything by the book. And then when I went to my interview, they basically told me that they're not looking for someone like me now, maybe come back in five years and reapply. Right. So I, so that's okay. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, if a country doesn't want, I'm not going to argue with it. It's, it is what it is. Right. So, yeah. Um, things are changing here to like, to be honest with you, Mike, I think we're going to lose pretty much most of our constitutional rights once the uh, once the cashless society kicks in, once we yeah. go to a central bank digital currency. Um, you know, I mean, I, I try not to live in fear of, of stuff like this, um, but it's pretty apparent that it's that it's happening, you know, and part of the uh, part of the rights of, of the United States and the uh, and the, you know, the people of America is to be. Um, you know, to be free to, to be secure in your privacy and, you know, the money that's, that's private when you have cash in the system, the moment that you lose that to like a central bank digital currency, there, there is no more, there is no more like privacy. There is no more rights that are there. Um, so it, it, it really seems obvious to me that the push for a central bank digital currency around the world, including within the United States, that will be the last, um, that will be the last bit of rights that we have. I mean, there might be some sort of like a uh, illusion mm -hmm. of it, but the, the down rooted rights that you have, as far as basically the right to privacy, it, it'll be gone. Well, so let me do a follow up from the housing and where we're at and the unaffordability and all that. And then them, them trying to fix it. Sure. Well, here's, here's where we're at right now. They're, they're taxing us yep. horribly. I've already been audited, I think, one, no, not audited, but I've been pro, uh, problems with some sort of taxes from five years ago. And then last year, I got, uh, I got like 11 notice of assessments where we went through your taxes and you owe this or there was a mistake in this or you owe this or you owe that. 11 I got in two months wow. last year. So they're going to tax us to death. Property taxes, Simon, you're not going to believe, you won't, I'll tell you what, what the property taxes are. You're just going to, you're not going to believe it. Um, in Brampton, Ontario, okay, you can look this up. Uh, my mom owned a home there. And then after my dad passed away, she, 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 she sold it. And her property taxes in the city of Brampton, which is about 35 minutes, 40 minutes from downtown Toronto, was about 7000 a year. Oh, yeah, Whoa. we're just talking an average home. Okay, okay, hold on. They implemented a new tax there two years ago. Are you ready for this? The roof, your roof, the width of your roof and the width of your driveway, the water that rains down, they're going to calculate the precipitation with the width of your driveway and the width of your roof. And then they're going to calculate a sewer tax for you for water going out. <laughs> Yeah, your 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 listeners could look that up. They're gonna be like, and they implemented it, and they're using it. Wow. Yeah. Um. So 
that's kind of interesting to think about. So a square footage house that's two stories as opposed to a ranch style would pay less taxes. Probably. I don't know. I, 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 I mean, that's just the first thing that kind of immediately comes to my mind is just like, wow, that's going to start producing a lot of two-story homes. Um, you know, it's just amazing where they come up with these ideas on how it is that they're going to tax us. I mean, it, it's just another, it, to me, like, when I hear stuff like that, it just sounds like another just unreasonable way of just, you know, generating revenue. Right. I mean, you know, it, it just, it doesn't really make sense, you know. So the, as of, sorry, of February of, I think it's implemented in February of this year or January, I don't think it's January, February of this year in a couple of weeks, there is five new federal taxes that are being implemented in our payroll in our all different stuff, like different levels of government are taxing us five different in five different angles already. So let's say you make a thousand dollars a week, one large. After all the taxes and, and, and your, your CPP and all that stuff they charge you, you're lucky if you come home with 600 bucks, Simon. Whoa, they're taking 40%. Oh, that's huge. You could ask anyone, you could people, I know a lot of people watch your channel and you're very popular. I'm pretty sure some people in Canadian people living north of the American border will comment below and say, yeah, this guy is, yeah. So it's pretty bad. And then when I come home and I got my gas bill here and $170 of it is carbon tax. Wow. Yeah, to heat my home. Yeah, yeah. I put a picture up on my Twitter so people could see it, my, my, my gas bill. It's just phenomenal. It's just beyond anything. And, and I, 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 it's getting to that point where, where Simon, I've, if I don't find some sort of strategy or another way to earn, I, I, I could see myself in five years being completely homeless. Um, man, that's, that's, that's heartbreaking to hear, man. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Like I try not to think about it too much um, as far as the income goes, but yeah, you know, I've noticed even like with the YouTube revenue and stuff like that, my income has been dropping, you know, every month for the last, you know, three, four months. And yeah, if it continues on this pace, I mean, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I won't be doing well here in the next, you know, four or five years like yourself. Uh, you know, but I, I'm hopeful that things will change or that I'll figure something out or, you know, you know, other opportunities will come about. So I don't stress it too much. But it's pretty apparent that it's it's happening everywhere, you know, even like, you know, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have thought about like, you know, stressing out over money or something like that. But now it's, you know, it's become, you know, obvious, like, you know, it's like you can't just you can't just ignore this. It's uh, it's going to be pretty damaging going into the future. I think about like the separation in classes that happen. It seems the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And every attempt that the governments make to try and change that only makes the problem worse. So I don't know what to say about like what the future is going to hold, but it's going to be pretty bad as far as that separation between the classes. I see Cantillon effect taking place and the, you know, the new money coming in is going to continue to pour into the rich elitist and it's going to take forever for the lower half to get that money. And the longer that takes place, the bigger the wedge gets. And the price of food's been becoming more and more out of reach. And uh, I was looking at a video I made back in 2015 where my wages aren't, uh, no, 2014, my wages are not keeping, no, 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 no. Rent, the price of food has surpassed the price of my rent. Wow. Yeah, that was a video I made back in 2014. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was doing my math. I was doing the math and I had me, my wife, my kid, and we had an, a second on the way. And we were realizing, look, we're going to have to leave the city if we want to have a family. So luckily, you know, I that foreign buyers tax came into play. And then you started to see housing cooling. So people in the outskirts. So I live three hours away from Vancouver, east of Vancouver in the town called Merritt. So I bought my house for like 260. And now the house is, was assessed the other day at like 690, I think. I just got the assessment uh, yesterday. So it's tripled or qu almost quadrupled in price since I bought it. Oh. And if I, if I did not leave the city, I, I, it would have been some serious hardships, right? And lack of space, lack of everything. Now I have a gi gigantic backyard, tons of bedrooms, lots of space, 
uh, to park cars, huge driveway. You know what I'm saying? So I have the space. I'm in a cul-de-sac. So I'm living a good life, Simon. But the, but there's one thing that I brought with me from Vancouver that's really dragging me down. What's that? Property tax. Mm. I'm at when I moved in, my property taxes were 1,600 a year, and now I'm looking at about 4,400. Wow. And there's two stoplights in my town. Well, three, if you want to count the one really out of town. Okay. So there's three stoplights. So there's no infrastructure here, Simon. So I'm not saying there's no infrastructure. There's things, but it's not worth paying, you know, that much property tax for. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen here over the next, like, say, two, three years when it comes to the uh, real estate market? You know, one of the things that um, I, I just did a video on this one. Let me see if I have it here. Um you know, one of the graphs that I look at is the current housing inventory. Yeah. And, um, you know, here's the graph of it. I don't know if you can see it on I can there. I see that. Yeah. Right. So you can see it is pretty dang low way down here, mm -hmm. um, down at the bottom. I would imagine that that is going to start spiking soon. I was going to say that. We're going to start seeing. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's that's the question that I really have is like how much, how big, how far out is that spike going to be? Do you have any idea? I do. Okay. In the United States of America, um, a lot of people over overpaid for a lot of properties in the interior, like rural parts of Texas, rural parts of Arizona, rural parts of Florida. They paid way too much for a lot of these properties they picked up in the last three years. Given what I've been seeing and the fluctuations and stuff and interest rates going up, hedging against the inflation, this double digit inflation, I'm seeing, Simon, in this Q1, it's going to slightly plateau, okay, this, in this quarter. Q2, you're going to start to see an uptick. And then by third quarter and fourth quarter of 2023, mark my words, you'll have a major oversupply on the market. Okay. Now, um, this is this is the big question, right? This big oversupply. And I'm trying to figure this one out because I'm not trying to deny it, but I'm trying to find out where is that inventory going to come from? Is it going to come from like unemployment rising? Is, is it going to come from like what's going to cause the inventory levels to rise? Same thing that's causing the over inventory in, in Toronto, Vancouver, Sydney, Australia. The same thing is going to happen in America. And it's going to be middle class Americans that are over leveraged okay. middle class Americans that use their homes as ATM machines or lived off the equity. Those are the first to fall. Those are the first to get hit. And if you want to go into sectors, the condo sector is always the first sector to fall. And then it's the housing and then it's the rural areas. What but is I it believe the first that goes? The condos? Huh? Was it condos the condo? go first. Condos are always, always go first because everybody... What a great investment. Let's buy a condo and rent it out for 30 years and have it paid off by our tenants. That's the number one thing to always go down when there is a correction is the condos fall, especially with parts of America, like in Seattle, where you have entire towers owned by foreign investors that no one lives in them, right? So they're cr creating this, 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 this fake shortage, but homeowners got wealthy on paper. And it's that middle class Americans that put the five, 10 percent down in the last two, three years and have been using their home equity to to eat. And I think it's that class of people that are going to be hit hard, the hardest first. That's mm -hmm. just my opinion. Right. And so, you know, because to be honest with you, Mike, I want I, I don't want to see people hurt. I don't, but I want to see. I want to see. I want to see a downturn in the housing market because I want to take advantage of that by buying rental properties if I can. Now, I'm not like gung-ho on this like it's not like my overall goal but it is something that i have like as far as a possibility that could come up right so if there is a downturn in this housing market to a significant level i would like to be in it how many other people do you think have shared that same idea um the people that are in that trajectory of buying and are mainly focused in the red states because in the red states, rural parts, good parts of Florida, rural parts of Texas, rural parts of, I don't know if Texas is still red, but uh, blue, blue, I mean, red, 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 sorry, yeah, red, yeah, red, no, red, yeah, sorry, I'm losing my mind yeah. here. Yeah, so right. people in the red states are, have that mentality you're thinking of, because you could go to rural Alabama, buy a nice, decent home with 10 acres of land for 140 grand. You could go and you could still buy things that are 
wages are within housing prices in a lot of those red states. So that mentality you're talking about is more of a red state thing. Uh, blue states, it's I think housing is 50% overpriced. It, that's just me. Mm-hmm. It's like Vancouver. I believe, like if I show you some images of some of the houses that sold for $3.4 million, Simon, you'll look at it and say, where's the house? Oh, it's on the floor. It's collapsed. And that Shoot. sold for $3.4 million. And, and people will look at that and say, yeah, that's a $3.4 million house. So someone looking at that saying that's a $3.4 million, that house is like 2,000% overpriced. Right. So we're going to have here north of you, we're going to have a correction of corrections. It's going to affect every human being living in within the Canadian boundary border. Within Canada, every human being is going to be affected when there is a housing correction here. Because it's built on a bubble, on a bubble, on a cruise ship, in the Gibraltar, on a windy, on a windy deck, on a house of cards. That's what Canada is. You guys are lucky in America because Amerifornia is starting to fizzle out. A lot of people left uh, Oregon to move to Nevada. A lot of people left and moved to uh, um, Utah and other places and started to trickle up. You started seeing a lot of renovations in Reno, Nevada, a lot of renovations in Phoenix, where you know tenants have been there for 10 years, they're getting kicked out, they're getting a paint job on their place, and they're doubling the rent. We saw that 2017, 2018, 2019, as Amerifornia started moving east, right? It's wagons east in America. And the people further east, minus New York and Illinois, uh, and other rural states like Indiana and stuff, they'll be okay from this. I think a lot of them are not severely over leveraged. I don't think they paid uh, double of what their house should be worth in some of those areas, but the mentality you're thinking is more of a red state. So Simon, you got to get into a red state, buddy. Yeah. I mean, I guess if I'm going to be buying that real estate up in it, you know, I mean, cause I'm, I, I mean, I'm stuck right in there. Like one of those buyers, right. I bought last year at the height of the market and, you know, like didn't want to, but I was kind of forced into it. If I wanted to stay in my area, there was literally like no place to go to. And either I could quit my job, take the kids out of school, move to a completely different area, or I could buy a house. And it took everything out of me to try and buy that house. And I'm sure that I'm going to see that the price of that house go down at some point. But it hasn't happened yet. Um, every estimate I look at at my house, it seems to have gone up. But then I'm in an incredibly hot area too, right. being like you know just outside of Portland and that. So I'm looking to it. It's going to be a downturn as far as like you know even in my own home. But I have to think about like how many houses were actually sold over the last couple of years at these incredibly high prices, and then how many people actually took out the equity during that time. Because I know that there was a lot of equity that was taken out because there was so much to be had and the interest rates were so low. It's just so enticing for people to do it. But I do have to question, like, how much of that actually happened out there? And then Not not as bad as Canada. Not as bad as Canada. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. Right. And because I'm trying to take on that strategy of like, okay, when is this going to happen? I personally, when I look at what happened during the great financial crisis – I see two things that were major causes of the of the spike in homes. One of that was the overbuild that was taking place, and the other one was the toxic securities, the uh, mortgage-backed securities right. that had turned toxic. Well, n- both of those things aren't necessarily occurring today. So really, this inventory spike is going to come from like people failing to make their house payment right. is really what it's going to come down to. And if that is the case, it's probably going to come from an, a spike in unemployment. Right. So you get the spike in unemployment. The unemployed people are unable to make their house payment. But even if that was the story behind it, it's still going to take like a year or two before we start seeing those foreclosures enter into the market. So really, are we two years out from a housing crash? You know, let me be really let me get I think I think it's going to be a little bit sooner. I think you're going to start to see the oversupply in Q3 of this year. And then in Q4, going into 2024, you're going to start to see massive, massive defaults. And I'll explain to you why. Um, it, you know, you brought up the jumbo loans and all the uh, bad lending practices. But if, let's say, America found a royal commission to come in and start to investigate the banks and the dealings and what they've been doing. and uh, So Australia got smart back in 2017. They got a royal commission to come in. Hear me out, Simon. The royal commission came in, scratched the surface of a few files, a few things, The amount of bank corruption they found just by scratching the surface was astronomical. 
One bank, Westpac, you can look it up, 26 million money laundering breaches in one year. That's like 11 per minute. <laughs> like, you have no, Simon. <laughs> you, so, like, let, let me, so let me break this down to, let's get to America now. In my heart of hearts, I know a lot of lenders and a lot of lending facilities have quotas. They have numbers to hit. They have to underwrite these deals. They got to get them approved. And what hurts me the most is how they misled a lot of the buyers into saying, sir, sure, you could go, you could own that house. They check their TDS, their total debt service ratio. Ooh, you're outside. You're in a gray zone. Let me help you with that. I'm going to make you up a pay stub and say you have a second job and I'm going to make that pay stub and put it in your file. I'm going to underwrite this deal, get it approved for you and get you that house that you need. So I believe there was a lot of fraudulent lending at the high levels. And it's very scary once you scratch the surface, Simon, once you start to see deals that should have never been approved from day one, because a good underwriter, like I could look at a deal, I could look at the credit, I could look at everything, I could look at the leverage and the liquidity, I could look at everything and I could tell you, this deal is going to fall apart in six months. Not because I'm trying to like be, uh, uh, I could look at a deal and tell you this, this guy's, this guy's not going to make it in six months. So I believe that the lending practices has made a lot of lenders into criminals by creating these falsehoods from the buyer or the borrower into thinking they could afford what they bought. And that's what scares me the most. The amount of malpractice lending, I think it's going to come and in, in, in catch up and in, in nip it in the bud. And that's what's going to be one of the big problems. Because if you get a Royal Commission in to start investigating Bank of America, all this, like an independent body, to start looking at what these deals, dude, they found a guy that's been dead four or five years in Australia. He's been dead. They've been charging him $3,600 a month in bank fees. Instead of calling his next of kin and say, hey, you got a bunch of money here from your grandfather. Do you want it? They didn't even do that. They just kept charging him the bank fees, even though he's been dead. So do you see where I'm going with this, Simon? So I'm afraid that the mal lending that happened, and it's happened in Canada, Simon, so much you have no idea. A lot of banks where the total debt service ratios don't fit, the credit doesn't look too good, not enough income to cover that $2 million shack they want to buy, but the bank's going to work to get them to get this. Now hear this. You know what they did in Canada back in 2015, 2016 to get uh, first-time home buyers into the – because Canada couldn't get first-time home buyers because the people in Canada just couldn't afford, even though we created this Frankenstein monster by lowering our rates so dangerously, okay, and creating these artificial bubbles. You know, you know what happens when you start lowering rates so dangerously. You create this Frankenstein monster that you don't know how to kill. But here's the deal. G- 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 guess what happened? It was so bad they couldn't get first-time home buyers that the government of Canada issued a first-time home buyer grant. And what did that do? And it did terrible because you have to pay it back with four percent vig or four percent interest. So you had to pay it back. So you don't get you know if you don't live in the house for a year you don't have to pay the grant like you guys do in the states or some states do it like that. But in Canada you have to pay that first-time home buyer, home buyers grant with four percent vig on it. And the problem with that, Simon was it created this little heat in the market because all these people were getting these first-time home buyer grants and getting in. Now they got the first-time home buyer grant to pay off. Then they got the house to pay off. And then most people have student loans to pay off. So they're in this predicament where they are completely. So Canada's a lot worse off. So Canada did everything to try to get first time home buyers into the markets because the people just couldn't get into their own markets. They were born, raised and educated. in. And that's what I was afraid of Amerifornia for you guys. I was so afraid that basically all of America will turn into California. And that, that's one of my biggest fears, you know, with, with what's been transpiring and it's headed in that direction. And I'm just, I don't know, Simon, I'm just. Yeah, let me see if I, th- if I think I got you right on this one. So like, we don't have necessarily the mortgage, like the toxic mortgage backed security thing that happened back in the great financial crisis. That's like right in our face. We may be having a, to- like the toxic mortgages due to the fact that these, like the mortgage writers who are, you know, just like anybody else desperate to make a sale, you know, you make your commissions off of it. And you're going to try and sell as much as you can, trying to get as many commissions as you can. And when you have to start getting creative, then that's really where the problem starts to come in, right? Before it was like right in their face, like they were just straight up, you know, no job, no verifications, none of that other stuff. But now 
we have like limitations on that kind of stuff to prevent it from happening, but it doesn't mean that there isn't windows of opportunities that they can take advantage exactly. of that we just don't know about that is being exploited out there, right? So what you're saying is that that could be very well the case. Big. That's going to be the toxic assets that come into the system that we're just not seeing. That's going to be Q4 of 20 of this year. You're going to start seeing that the tux, the toxic, I guess, toxic mortgages or whatever you want to call them, yeah. reliance of credit. Now, now, a lot of people here in Canada are on these variable rate mortgages. Okay? okay. And so they got these variable rate mortgages to get people in. Now, people are trying to switch from their variable rate to a fixed rate. I have a friend that I spoke to personally a, a week ago. They won't let him switch. It's going to cost so much money in paperwork. It's going to cost this. He finally got it switched. It cost him $8,000 in fees. Wow. Yeah. So they just added it on to his mortgage. So this is so, but not only that, not only that, are you ready for this, Simon? Yeah. Interest only mortgages now are coming up for renewal. Oh no. Man, see now that's that's a terrible idea because the interest only mortgages, that's really where I see like it can descend prices of homes just like like unstoppable you know, at that point, because if you have an interest only loan and you have high interest rates, you start dropping the interest rates, you know, the Canadian central, you know, the central bank or whatever decides that they're going to start easing monetary policies and you still have that in play, man, that can send house prices just ungodly high. I mean, to my, to me, interest only loans are a terrible idea. They did that um, to get first home, first time home buyers. And because we couldn't compete right. with the money, we just couldn't compete with the money laundering. Now, the headline that I, I urge your listeners to look, to look up, just to reference this, just so they know, it's called Canada would be in a recession without money laundering, and it's by Better Dwelling, and it's broken down in graphs, and it shows you down by province how much money was laundered in the hundreds of billions per province. And the Canadian Money Laundering Task Force was shut down two times in Canada. Whoa. Well, because once they start looking and digging, Wait a minute. Right. What the heck's been going on for the last 10 years? So that tax task force was shut down. So I made a video about that a few years back too. They keep shutting down our money laundering task force. Is that is, is that for like I mean, kind of seems counterintuitive, but, but is that for like national security reasons so you don't actually have a collapse of the system? It could be. I think they just put that in place just to give a bunch of people a bunch of jobs and then they started doing their job and realizing, mm -hmm. "Hey, this is a very major irregularities we're having here. <laughs> I think we need to look into this a bit further. Nope, we're shutting it down. <laughs> yeah. yep. You guys found out too much here. <laughs> yep, we're shutting it down. And this is the problem, Simon. Um, the difference between the United States and, and Canada is Canada has been heavily, heavily dependent on real estate to proper GDP. You guys have it. That's the difference. Us, we build homes, we export them to China. They, that's what they say here. Uh, well, they're building condo towers. Oh, that's going to be good. Some people are going to own them and leave them empty. That's what people say here. And 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 it's that's just what it is, Simon. And a lot of us that that refugees, city refugees that move to small towns like myself, we're bringing that property tax with us. We're bringing the cost of living up with us. And we're running out of places uh, in Canada. We don't have, we have crown land. And that's something your listeners should look into. The crown of England owns like 96% of our land. It's all locked. Well, I think it's 94%, Simon. I, I'm not sure. But someone in the comments could, could verify that. It's almost, it's a ridiculous amount of land that we don't own as Canadians. We're not allowed to build on. And it's owned by the crown of England. And what, I mean, what's the overall advantage for them on that? Is just to be in control or? Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, New Zealand unlocked a lot of its uh, um, crown land a few years ago to build more housing. Australia unlocked a bit of its crown land too. Canada is pretty like locked tight, man. We can't really get, um, you know what I mean? We it's, Our land is locked down tight. We try, I think regionally, they try to open an area to open up a new facility for, you know, for older people or, you know, something like with a stadium or, you know, something bigger outside the city. And they wouldn't allow it because it was on crown land and they won't unlock that land. Hopefully one of your viewers could clarify that for me in the comments and, and kind of explain that because that's a big problem here too. We're not wide open like you guys in the States where you guys have private land. And I think you guys have state owned land and federal land and stuff like that. We have crown land and that has, that goes back to old England. Wow. And that's kind of incredible to think about that out of all the, People who live in Canada, you're dividing up 
all of Canada to like six percent of all of Canada amongst all of you guys? That's correct. <laughs> that's that's like, correct. You guys get a little tiny piece. That's correct. You, you I, I'm pretty sure somebody will confirm that in the comments below. I'm not sure if it's 91 or 94. I know it's a massive percentage of our land is crown wow. and we we just not private property so unfortunately being a private citizen here in canada has been really hard simon and can i touch on one more thing sure yeah okay what's been really hurting me a lot or hurting us a lot especially me being a private citizen in the private sector entrepreneur small business owner is yes we're being taxed to death but the problem is the people in the public sector jobs like teachers uh, policemen, firefighters, all that stuff, their wages have been going up with the cost of living. So the average police is making 140000 or 160000 a year. Teachers are making anywhere from ninety dollars to 120000 a year. They're making these huge wages on the public sector, but it's being funded from us that could barely afford to even eat. Yeah. So there's an article that was put up. Somebody brought it to my attention, and it's a very important one. Nine out of 10 jobs that were created in 2021 and 2022 were government public sector jobs in Canada. Nine, 90% of them? Yes. I was going to make a video about it today on my channel. And I said, oh, let me calm down. I'm going to see Simon. To, I'm going to talk to Simon tonight. I was going to make the video today. It's, uh, I think the Globe and Mail is reporting it. I think it's the Globe and Mail. You can find it. You'll see it. And you will see what I'm talking about. It's become completely public sector here, Simon. And I don't know how the government is going to fund its obligations. The only way they, I see it is they're going to tax us to death and yeah. disenfranchise the middle class and take whatever they can from us. And it's getting to that point now where, again, I will be homeless in five years. I'll, lose, I'll end up losing everything, not because of mal spending practices or bad investment choices, because they're just taking it from us one by one. And I'll have to sell off my assets to just... Ex ex have a mere existence yeah um let me give you a hypothetical scenario that i think might be taking place with you so you have the foreign investors coming in and buying up a bunch of property and that's driving up the gp like the the gross profit of the uh canadian government since right? 2010 okay yeah. so since 2010 this is something interesting if you again like you just i'm such a i love cantillon's theory and i follow the flow of money and the, what happens when the new money starts coming into a state. So this is, again, like I couldn't be positive on what's happening here, but I have a suspicion that as the new money was coming in from the foreign investment going into Canada, that foreign money coming in started driving people into having more money to spend within the, within the state, right? So as the foreign investment was bringing new money coming from outside the country into the country, now Canada has more money from this foreign investment coming in. The people who have access to that money were the property owners, the people who sold off that foreign, you know, to the foreign investment. Now with that money, the new people who, or the people who have access to that new money, they're moving into luxuries. They start buying into some of the things that they like and enjoy. Now, the problem with that is, is that as they start moving into those luxuries, what they are doing is they are driving in ever increasing amounts of foreign production and driving out ever increasing amounts of domestic manufacturing as this foreign imports are competing with the domestic manufacturing that are happening there in Canada. And this is the reason why you're having that separation between the rich and the poor. So what's going to continue to happen is if that foreign investment gets cut off, well, then that's the new money that was coming into the state. If that new money isn't coming into the state, then what ends up happening is that there's not enough domestic manufacturing or input or basically being able to export and bring new money in. When that new money gets turned off, the whole country will fall into poverty after that. That's correct. So that's correct. we so saw signs. Yeah. We saw signs of that in Australia during 2020, 2021 lockdowns where Australia housing market was, it's a, the article read is Australian housing market in dire straits due to lack of foreign investing. I think that's what it was worded as. Yeah. And that, that basically started to immediately start to make a correction in the housing market because the money wasn't being shipped over. Right. Right. And, and I want to make this very clear for your listeners and stuff, just so they know. I have nothing against foreign investing, and I think foreign investing is good. It's just when it's laundered and when it's illegally brought in and when it's not declared and when it's uh, is a problem. I have nothing against the Chinese community. My ex, my ex I hope my wife's not listening. My ex-girlfriend was Chinese. 
My wife today is Filipina. Like I have nothing against any of the, you know, I'm a very open culture guy. I speak Spanish. I live in Mexico for two years, believe it or okay. not. I lived in Miami for five years. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I've been around. I've I, very cultured, very tried tons of food. I, I, yeah. I love it. So I have nothing yeah. against nobody. I really no, don't. None of, this is, none of this is accusatory towards any particular individuals or anything like that. It's just more of just, you know, stating the facts of what's occurring, you know? Right. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not anybody to blame on this. It's more of just the cyclical thing that is happening. You know, when the opportunity for foreign investment came in, then it started getting, you know, basically it started becoming popular that that movement isn't necessarily something that is like somebody's fault you know it's just more of a cyclical thing that is just occurring and although we may not like the idea of it it's not necessarily something that you can control without like you know say government intervention or something like that happening it's an economic event that is occurring and you know you just kind of have to recognize it as it's happening I mean, here in the United States, I mean, we're our major new money that comes in comes in from the selling of our debt. You know, right. we sell U.S. Treasuries to the rest of the world. This is how we get our new money in. You know, when you're selling, you know, property off to foreign investors, you only have so much property. It's going to get to a limit. We have unlimited amount of debt that we can sell and drive ourselves deeper and deeper into a hole that's just not something you can recover from. You know, yeah. so. America's biggest export is inflation. Yeah. So, so basically, that's what's happened here, you know. And 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 uh, let, let's put the let's play the blame game. You know who's to blame for this? Our administration and previous administration. They knew, they created the Vancouver model. They allowed people to come in with money. The administration should have put background checks, all kinds of checks. And you wouldn't believe it, Simon. There was um, a TV show that they had to take off the air that went for two seasons of of border control thing vancouver airport and they were catching people that were lying and bringing in entire suitcases of cash oh like, wow entire suitcases of money like and they weren't declaring it and then they had to seize it all and they had to actually take the show off the air because uh, every episode it was like seven or eight people call caught with suitcases full of cash and this resulted from the capital flows from china yeah. and these capital flows china actually put more effort in than our Canadian government to stop this from happening. The Chinese government put a, a clamp on, uh, on capital flows in 2017, and they did it back again in 2020 because they were realizing all their wealth was leaving. Yeah. And I made two videos. I made two videos on this, on the, the dates that it happened, um, addressing this issue that the Chinese government is actually realizing they're losing their wealth to foreign, foreign housing. So the China did what they can. And in cooperation with the, you know, I guess the Canadian side, Canadian side was wide open. The Vancouver model, bring your money here. We don't care where you bring it from. And that, I think, to blame is actually the administration in Canada for allowing this to happen for so many years that an educated person born and raised in a Canadian city already is bought out of their own housing market. Even if they start working at nine years old, they still can't get in. Yeah. You see? How long can you go? Like how how much farther can this be pushed before the before the system begins to, to collapse on it? I mean, it's obviously starting to take place now where you just, you know, you can't function through society anymore. Like, you know, if you have if you're if you're so debt saturated after you have got a student loan and a house and a car that you just can't seem to function anymore, then you know, you you know that you're at the end of the game. Like, you know, how are you supposed to, you know, advance and have goals for life that you're gonna be like you know, sitting in a position in which that you are going to have a better life than, than what, you know, than what your kids are going to have. You're not, you're going to send your kids into a life that's worse than yours. And that's like, not something that people are eager to do. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to start a family and then tell your kids, I'm sorry, your life is going to be worse than ours. You know, yeah. I mean, like nobody wants to do that. No. And that's, that's the case. That's what's happening. Yeah. And this way I've been full frontal, like with this war against protecting or, kind of creating awareness that the, the middle class is under attack. And, and it's been something that I've been very vocal about, that the middle class is diminishing. And without a middle or upper middle class, I mean, we don't have a proper functioning society. And, and if a first-time homebuyer can get into his own market in his own city that he's educated in, you don't have an economy anymore. 
That's it. I mean, it all comes down to the property owners, you know, and whether or not they are successful at being able to profit it off of that property and you know when you're sitting in a situation now where it's like the only people who really have access to property are going to be the rich elitist and everybody else is going to have to suffer without it's you're coming to a, a point in the game where it's just uh, society isn't going to function in the fashion that it once was like, you know, this is one of the things that I just been so focused in on and I'm trying to like come up with a, maybe a report or a video or something to talk about it, but really the traditional life, the traditional family, the, you know, get married young, have kids, you know, do the career kind of thing. It's almost out the window at this point. Right. And the societal collapse that comes from that, is going to be in, intense. I mean, I don't think people quite realize it. You know, you have a great time now, you know, just living your life or whatever. But when you realize that there is no new generation to start businesses, to manufacture, to even take care of you, you're going to find that, you know, times get very tough and there's really nobody there to uh, to fix the situation. Right. Yeah. We were, I remember reporting on, this was back in 2017, Simon. $3,400 uh, now was considered affordable rent in Vancouver. Like, yeah, the, the article's up on my channel. That was I, read, I read the article. Oh 34 God. or 3200 I got it. I'll send you the link to it. I read it back in 2017. That's how bad it got, Simon. That's, that's the position we were. We don't have that American dream position where you could just move to a rural part of Canada. Everything's overpriced. Everything's super expensive. And it's cold six six to nine months of the year or eight months or six months or five months of the year, depending what part of the region of Canada you're in. We don't have much of a choice here and we're running out of, of options. And, you know, I love Canada. I love where I live. I love living in the mountains. I love the, the pine everywhere. It's like I live in, I watch, I've been watching that show Yellowstone recently with my wife. Right. And it, I, it's like, we live there, like that kind of mountainous, beautiful region, beautiful rivers, pine trees everywhere, beautiful rural like nice roads going into these, these, you know, cattle farms and all that. It's really nice where I live. And I'm very grateful being here. I just, it just breaks my heart to see that the Canadian dream, just living a basic life and just doing what you want to do and not really have to worry about where you, how you're going to buy your next meal. It, it, we're getting to that. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, I left the big city cause I knew it was happening. And then now I brought this problem here. Now, Property tax is going up. The cost of living isn't getting any cheaper. My gas bill, I think it was 500 bucks. It's becoming one and then 150 of it was carbon taxes. And they're adding, hold on, one of the new five taxes I mentioned earlier the, of the new five taxes is a secondary carbon tax. <laughs> What's the secondary carbon tax? I don't tax know. Deal? I don't know. We, uh, <laughs> I'll look it up later. I saw it. It's a secondary carbon tax they're adding now. And I don't know. They tried doing this back in New England, back in the 1870s, 1880s, where they wanted to charge cattle or farmers for a head of cattle and head of horse uh, for carbon tax, methane tax. That was the carbon. No, it was the Carbon Protection Act or carbon. What was it called? Uh, methane Protection Act. That was back in the 1870s, 1880s. They were trying to con farmers in New England to tell them that the methane is destroying and that was called the methane protection act. I think you could find old flyers or old like war, like war write-ups of it, how they were trying to ch charge head of head of cattle and head of, head of horse per, uh, per far, like depending on how big the farm was. Right. And they tried so, that back. Yeah. So this is like, a, this is like century old scam that they're trying oh, to buddy. <laughs> buddy, let's fast forward. Let's fast forward to, 1960, 1970. What was 1960, 1970, Simon? Come on, you're a climate expert. You know this. Come on. 1960, 1970 with the, uh, with the oil embargoes and stuff like that? Wait, no, climate, climate. I, I acid know. rain. Oh, acid rain. Okay, yeah. Acid right. rain's going <laughs> to melt everything. You're yeah. not, you know. So 60s and 70s was acid rain. And the 1981 to 1984 was the Ozone Protection Layer Act okay. that the ozone layer has a hole. Yeah, remember that know. you're around you kind of remember that right yep and then in 2008 it was global warming and the favorite part my favorite part about global warming simon was my barber my mechanic the guy shoveling the snow outside 
some guy randomly watching this video, they were all climate experts. Oh, yeah. Everybody was a climate expert. Yeah. Florida is going to be underwater by 2010. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. Oh, my God. So then from there, and then we got into climate change. And I think we're now in climate emergency. I think is that what it is. Yeah, I'm not sure what it's called right now, but uh, but yeah, there's, it's always been something, you know. So yeah, it, it, you're right. I mean, I didn't think about that. I forgot all about how the acid rain was going to melt us all away. Yeah, you're right, man. It's always been something out there, like some kind of boogeyman, demon, environmental issue that's going to you know destroy the entire thing if we don't if we don't do something about it. You know, destroy the planet. That was pretty funny to think about. I forgot all about acid rain. Um, <laughs> that was good stuff. But there's always yeah, something. There's good. always something, like you said. There's always a boogeyman. There's always something around the corner that yeah. wandering monster. I call it wandering monster. Comes huh. up to you, hits you with the, with the you, and then it's like, what? What they're saying that now? So, yeah, I don't want to get too political. You can come back on Mike of the night and get political with me. And yeah, that uh, sounds fun. Yeah. And Mike, um, so, you know, we talk a lot of gloom and doom stuff. Is there anything exciting that you see happening? Like anything that like, you know, is encouraging or something that's just like, man, that's going to be kind of fun to have in our life here coming into the future. Is there anything like that that you think about or. I see. The facade falling. The walls, the barriers, the lies. I see everything coming down in the next three quarters. And I see. A lot of pain but in turn i think for all of us that are around then the borealis will come in view for all of us to see at the same time i think it's going to be this big drop of the veil a big drop of the wall a big drop of of the status quo that basically is gonna bring in a new ushering a new forward for us i don't know if i'll be alive to see it but but I, I just have a feeling when that Borealis comes in view, everyone's going to stop if they're on their phones, reading a book, driving. Everyone's going to catch attention to it. And I think when that falls and that facade falls and that curtain falls, and I think it's going to change. I think a lot of things are going to change. And I think hopefully our perspectives will change with it and we could bring prosperity and the key to prosperity and the key to happiness is love, right? Love is everything. Love conquers everything. I don't like my neighbor. Well, love him. Well, I don't like him. Love him. Start loving your, just love him. Love everybody. Well, you know, and that's what I, that's my mentality. Is just, I truly wholeheartedly just, I just love, you know, love is there. And if, if more people could share love, more people could be in love, more people could search for love. If more people could bring love to the front lines, I think it will solve 90% of the issues we're in right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me tonight, man. It's been a great time. Anytime, brother. I'm here for you. You know that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I look forward to coming on Mike in the night next time. We'll definitely hit out some political views because I definitely want to talk some politics with you at some point. Sure. And, um, you know, I like I like to keep it off on my channel. But, you know, you came up with some really good insight into the housing market. Uh, definitely gave us some, you know, some good views of what's happening in the Canadian market, something that we can look to see what's happening here in the United States as possible possibilities to occur. You know. Um, I don't know of anybody who works as hard as you do, man. You really put the effort in. And, uh, man, I appreciate you for that. No, no problem, man. I, I, you know, I just feel like I, it's something I need to do or something, I guess, to de-stress or something to, I don't know, it's just something I, I, I feel needs to be done. If I'm, I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I'm wrong. I know what I feel, though. Yep. And that's that's the only thing we can do. We, you know, I mean, if... I know you're an honest, you're an honest person, right? You are coming out here and you are talking the way you feel. You're not trying to make it up so that you can entertain somebody so that you can just, you know, whatever, get their attention. I mean, this is truly how you feel. Mm -hmm. And this is the, truly the way I feel too. And that's what makes these conversations so, so awesome is because we're not trying to like, you know, pull something over somebody's eyes and try and make them believe something that, you know, is false or anything. This is what we think. This is the way we feel. So I appreciate it, man. No problem, brother. God bless you. God bless you.
uneducated economist, you guys let me know.